His name is Jacob. In the Hebrew Bible, he is one of the founding patriarchs of the Jewish faith. But Jacob's character seems deeply flawed. It's very unflattering to think that Jacob, who in the end will give his name to the Jewish people, begins his career by cheating his old blind father. Why did God choose such a man for so magnificent a destiny? Jacob's life is filled with mysteries. What was the real nature of Jacob's ladder, the miraculous span which linked heaven and earth? Jacob wrestles through a long, dark night with a stranger who is never identified. Was it an angel? Could it have been God himself? Why did this honored patriarch marry two sisters, an act which is forbidden by the Bible? And what impenetrable force has protected his tomb for over 3,000 years? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. According to the Hebrew Bible, it was here, in this ancient land, thousands of years ago, that God forged a sacred covenant with Abraham. Then God brought Abraham outside beneath the nighttime sky and told him, Look up into the heavens and count the stars. Your descendants shall be like that, too many to count. Genesis 15, 5. Abraham is the patriarch, the father of the Jewish people. And he's the one who received the promise that all of your descendants will bear my special mission and will be my chosen people. The Holy Covenant passes from father to son, from Abraham to Isaac, and then to Jacob. But Jacob's story is one of the most provocative and controversial in the Bible. It began here over 3,500 years ago. This is Beersheba, 50 miles south of Jerusalem. Strangely, even before Jacob is born here, he is locked in struggle. He and his brother Esau share the womb of their mother, Rebekah, and she is tormented by them. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? Genesis 25, 22. This struggle in the womb has intrigued readers for thousands of years. In legends collected in the Midrash and elsewhere, and in the arguments of the Talmud, rabbis search for meaning and justification. Does Jacob fight his brother only to gain the upper hand? Or is his struggle in the womb really an act of kindness? 
by the seventh month, Rebecca was doing an imitation of a Stephen King heroine going, get these out of me. Uh, the two boys, were told, were struggling in the womb. And in fact, Esau was so anxious to be born, he was willing to kill Rebecca to do it. Jacob restrained him, and that's why he was actually grabbing onto his brother, was to try to give him uh, less of an opportunity to make their mother miserable. Esau is born first. Though Jacob follows so closely as to be holding onto his brother's heel, it is Esau who is the older. This difference, though marked by so brief a moment, is profoundly important. Think of it, Esau is the older son, and in the ancient world, the older son was almost invariably the one who got the inheritance and came into the special privileges and was the leader of the family. But instead, it goes to Jacob. What Jacob has failed to inherit, he will seek through cunning. As the brothers grow into manhood, they develop distinctly different characters and habits. Esau becomes a skillful hunter a man of the open country. Jacob stays at home by the tents and the hearth. It is in this difference that Jacob finds his chance to displace Esau. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country. Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Genesis 25, 27. Esau agrees, and in this instant, the lineage of the Jewish people is established. The birthright traded for a bowl of stew includes the covenant with God that will now pass to the descendants of Jacob rather than Esau. However, the momentous turn depends on a transaction that seems morally ambiguous. It is true that Esau technically sells the birthright to Jacob, but even the rabbis of the Talmud recognized that a deal made under duress is not legally binding. And Esau is clearly under duress. He says he's starving. If the way Jacob acquires the birthright from Esau has troubled scholars, the next occurrence presents an even deeper mystery. Isaac, the father of Esau and Jacob, asks Esau to hunt wild game and cook it for him. In return, he will give Esau a blessing. While the hunter is gone, Rebekah, the boy's mother, prepares a meal for Jacob to serve. Jacob fears he will be detected, even though Isaac is blind. Jacob said to Rebekah, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? Genesis 27, 11. Rebecca devises an ingenious solution. She covers Jacob's hands and neck in goatskins with the hair still attached. Then Jacob went close to his father who said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Are you really my son Esau? I am, he replied. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. Genesis 27, 21. After the kiss, Isaac bestows his blessing. According to it, Jacob is to enjoy earthly abundance and is to be obeyed by his brother in all things. Then Esau returns from the hunt. 
Even though Esau is not really a hero in the Bible, one of the most poignant and painful moments in the entire Bible is when he comes back and discovers that he was cheated and cries out, bless me, father. This Isaac cannot do, for he has already given the blessing to Jacob and he cannot take it back. And the environment of the ancient Near East, which exists to this very day in some quarters, is that an oath, a promise, a blessing, a curse, solemn declarations of the mouth are not revocable. You don't swear to do something and then take it back. You don't do it. The generations of scholars who have pondered this incident have proposed another possibility. They suggest that in fact Isaac knew all along it was Jacob he was blessing, and that in doing this he was fulfilling the will of God. Isaac is old and blind, but like any father, he knows his children. And there is a long line of interpretation that suggests when he gave that blessing to Jacob, though he could never admit it, he knew exactly what he was doing. However, even if Isaac was not deceived by Jacob's ploy, it is certain that Jacob attempted fraud. Ironically, for many readers, the very unworthiness of this act confirms the reliability of the Bible's account. As to the character of Jacob, the char maybe it actually lends greater veracity to the Bible itself. If God had chosen some plaster saint, it would have, we might have suspected that the whole thing was a setup. In all of his characters, you have real people, and real people do real things, and real things aren't necessarily morally pure. The all too human drama now accelerates, for Esau is furious at what Jacob has done. In an attempt to escape his murderous wrath, Jacob will flee into a terrifying wilderness. When we return, a mysterious dream linking heaven and earth. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, my father will be gone soon, and when he is, I will kill Jacob. Genesis 27, 41. To save one of her sons from death and the other from becoming a murderer, Rebecca sends Jacob to his uncle's home in Haran, far to the north. Jacob's journey will not be easy. Soon after leaving Beersheba and the gentle plain on which it rests, he finds himself in a strange and difficult terrain. He went up high mountains, nearly a thousand meters above sea level. He's in a territory which is physically and emotionally completely different from the place in which he grew up. Jacob makes camp in a place he will later call Bethel the place where God lives. But Jacob is not the first to regard this as a sacred site. It's important to realize that virtually all the major spots that are talked about in the history of the patriarchs were sacred spots before they got there. That's the case with Beersheba, it's the case of Bethel. All these places are known to have had pagan cultic sites even before the Israelites ever got near them. It is here, far from home, deep in a strange and threatening land, at a place of worship for God's unknown to him, that Jacob will sleep this fateful night.
Well, the first thing you notice when Jacob comes to Bethel is that he's frightened, he's vulnerable, and he has to go to sleep in the out of doors. Now, we've been told before that Jacob was a man of the tents, not a man of the fields. So he is not a hardy outdoorsman in his L.L. Bean gear, getting ready for a night in the great outdoors. He suspects that he might well become the victim of demonic attack. Instead of demons, Jacob will be visited by angels. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending. There above it stood the Lord. Genesis 28, 12. God speaks to Jacob. He promises his protection and affirms that it is through Jacob and his offspring that the Holy Covenant will become the faith of a great people. Through the ages, countless generations of artists have tried to envision this scene. What did Jacob's ladder really look like? Actually, the Hebrew word for it, maslul, means a ramp. Uh, we think of it as a ladder you have to climb rungs on, but it's not that way. It's a ramp. It's a kind of a pathway up to heaven. Some have speculated that Jacob's ladder was in reality a ziggurat a step pyramid of the kind that was commonly found in the ancient Near East. Strangely, when Jacob wakes from his miraculous and mysterious dream, he makes a vow which seems to place conditions on God. If God will help and protect me on this journey and bring me safely back to my father's house, then I will choose the Lord as my God. Genesis 28, 20. Jacob makes deals. That's what he does. And he made this deal with God. He just wanted to be sure that he was well covered and that, uh, and that God understood his terms. It's a pretty amazing piece of arrogance, but there it is. At the pivotal point of human history up to now, which is God's approach to Abraham and God's promise of a covenant, of a land, of a law, of a future, all of that rests on Jacob's shoulders. The problem is that up to this point, Jacob doesn't seem to be the kind of noble figure who can carry that forward. Jacob is now about to begin a striking new phase of his life, which will test him in a way that is completely unexpected. He resumes his journey and eventually reaches the home of his uncle, Laban. Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. It is Rachel who captivates Jacob and opens a new world for him. When he sees Rachel, and falls in love with her immediately, we begin to understand the noble side of what we have seen of Jacob. The same person who is ambitious and who is full of schemes is also full of heart and an awareness of his own destiny. And now he finds the woman that he believes will play the key role in that destiny. And in fact, he's right. Significantly, Rachel is the younger of Laban's daughters. It is a measure of Jacob's love that in choosing her, he is foregoing considerable wealth. In this time and place, only the older daughter comes with a large dowry. 
In the ancient world, marriages were more often matters of economics than they were matters of love. And I think that's one of the mysteries of Jacob's behavior is that he doesn't want the elder daughter who would come with more stuff. He wants the younger daughter, even though she may not come with as many sheep. To earn the right to marry Rachel, Jacob agrees to work for Laban for seven years. He does not regard the effort as a burden. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him. So great was his love for her. Genesis 29, 20. But Rachel and Leah and Laban will all conspire against Jacob. When we return, Jacob betrayed on his wedding night. To this day, three and a half thousand years after the time of Jacob and Rachel, it is the groom who places the veil of marriage on his betrothed in traditional Jewish weddings. Legend says this is because of what was done to Jacob on his wedding night. In ancient wedding ceremonies, it was very common to keep the bride separate and to engage in a feast which would run from anything from seven to ten days. During that time, the bride is veiled. Was Jacob unable to see the face of the woman he was marrying because it was covered by a veil? In a bizarre twist, Rachel's father puts Leah in Rachel's place. When evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. When morning came, there was Leah. Genesis 29, 23. It may be that he's just so excited that the seven years are up that he's not paying very close attention. I think the fact that brides are normally veiled, which is one of the marks of their married status, makes it quite conceivable that Laban could have played the trick that he did. Look, it's pretty obvious that uh, one of the great mysteries of this whole story is how anybody could basically consummate a marriage with a woman and not know that it's the wrong woman with whom he's consummating the marriage. Uh, no matter how much we want to say that in those days they had, uh, you know, veils and they didn't know each other, etc., this doesn't answer the question. Again, a legend developed outside the Bible attempts to explain this extraordinary incident by relating it to Jacob's deception against his father. Deception has come full circle and he realizes that he's been fooled, he goes running to Rachel and says to her, how could you fool me? After all, I thought we were in love. And Rachel, recalling to him how he once fooled his own blind father, said, I learned it from the master. I learned it from you. When Jacob, confounded and outraged, confronts Laban, his uncle offers an excuse. He explains that custom demands the older daughter to be married before the younger. Then he makes Jacob another offer. Finish this daughter's bridal week. Then we will also give you the younger one in return for another seven years' work. And Jacob did so. Genesis 29, 26. Although it may seem extraordinary to modern readers, marriage to more than one woman was not unusual in ancient times. But marrying two sisters is a practice specifically forbidden by the Bible. This is one of the great mysteries of the Bible, and it's called a mystery of the Bible in Talmudic sources. They actually speak about what's called the mysteries of forbidden marriage. 
The ancient rabbis resolved this mystery by asserting that Jacob married Rachel and Leah before the law against such marriages existed. Knowing that she is not the favored wife, Leah attempts to win Jacob's affection with the sons she bears him. Her struggle is commemorated in the meaning of their names. Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Judah. So her first son was Reuben, Reuben. And she said, because God has seen my misery. Reu, he's seen. And the second son was Shimon, because God has heard my prayer and perhaps my husband will love me. And the third son was Levi, and perhaps God has followed me or something. And the fourth son was Judah, Yehuda, because the Lord has heard me and perhaps my husband will love me and I will praise the Lord, etc. A strange contest now develops between Leah and Rachel. Leah continues to bear sons, while Rachel, Jacob's favorite, remains barren. Finally, in her desperation to give Jacob a child, Rachel sends her servant in her place. Jacob accepts the maid, and this union produces two more sons. Leah responds by sending her maid to Jacob. And this results in yet another two boys. Then Leah herself bears three more children. Finally, Rachel's prayers for a child are answered. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. Genesis 30, 22. Out of this anguished and intense human drama, a destiny is being fulfilled which will have a profound effect on history. Later in the biblical account, the rivalry will result in the 12 sons from whom will spring the 12 tribes of Israel. Through the years that Jacob's wives and their maids are bearing him children, he is rewarded in other ways as well. Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks of maidservants and men servants and camels and donkeys. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and I will be with you. Genesis 31, 3. The time of reckoning has come. Jacob must return home and face Esau, the brother he cheated so long ago, the brother who talked of killing him. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him along with all his goods to the land of his father. Genesis 31, 17. Jacob can only wonder how he will be received by his family. Has he been forgiven? Or does his brother Esau still nurture a smoldering hatred and a thirst for revenge? Setting up camp on the banks of the Jabbok River, Jacob sends servants on ahead with messages of apology and reconciliation. They return with an alarming report. Esau is coming to meet his brother, but he is accompanied by a force of 400 men. Hoping to placate him, Jacob sends his brother a gift, a great herd of sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Now Jacob escorts his family safely across the Jabbok, and then returns to what he thinks will be a night of solitude. He is wrong.
He is about to meet a mysterious adversary and engage in a fight which will define the very nature of his legacy. For thousands of years, scholars and poets and mystics have tried to unravel this mysterious, this haunting, this dark and unfathomable episode and tried to figure out what is at the heart of this vision and this story that has so influenced the rest of the Bible and through it, the rest of civilization. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched. Genesis 32, 24. The text says he met a man. Doesn't say an angel. He met a man and he wrestled with him all night. What on earth was going on there? Who was this man? It's impossible to imagine wrestling with God. I mean, <laughs> you touch him and you disintegrate. It's impossible to imagine that. So it's got to be something between, between God and man. And so tradition is settled on an angel, but we have no idea what that means. Despite the injury to his hip, Jacob continues to cling to his mysterious opponent, refusing to let him go until he is blessed. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. It is Israel, because you have struggled with God. Genesis 32, 27. The name Israel means struggle with God. And the reason that Jacob's name was chosen is because all of his descendants have struggled as well. And when they were involved in that fight with whatever foe it may be, human or divine, they looked to their ancestor Jacob, their ancestor Israel, and they learned from him. And that's why in the end, we're not the people of Abraham or the people of Isaac. We're the children of Israel. Pious people in our generation might have thought that the most admirable thing is simply to obey God and what God says do without question. That is not the worldview of the Hebrew Bible. From the earliest times, the Bible records man struggling, questioning, confronting the God who created the universe. That's remarkable. There's no parallel to this in the whole ancient Near East. After Jacob receives his new name, Israel, he asks the mysterious stranger for his name. The stranger says this is a question Jacob must not ask. In the Bible in general, and in the book of Genesis in particular, names are vital for understanding the character of, of the person. And nobody knows the name of God. Because to know the name is to know the essence of the person. And that has to be mysterious. Although the stranger refuses to give his name, the Bible suggests Jacob has no doubt about his identity. Jacob named the place Penuel, the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is spared. Genesis 32, 30. So there's always the joy and the fear, which is part of the image of wrestling also, it seems to me, that that's part of our wrestling with God as well. That when we do encounter God, it is both a wonderful and a terrifying experience for us that has been so provocative and powerful in the lives of so many men and women of God. When we return, a magnificent destiny is fulfilled and the search for the ten lost tribes of Israel.
Twenty years have passed in Jacob's life since he fled the wrath of his brother. Twenty years since he deceived their father to get the blessing meant for Esau. Now Jacob crosses the Jabbok River and prepares to face his brother and the 400 men he has brought. To many scholars in the dramatic confrontation about to unfold, there is far more at stake than the relationship between two brothers. Jacob and Esau don't re represent simply a dysfunctional family. They represent a dysfunctional region where closely allied groups, groups that could almost be considered kin, are at each other's throats over competition for the land and the water resources found there. This is not just the story of second millennium Canaan. This is the story of 20th century uh, Middle East. This is the story we see in our newspapers every day. As he approached his brother, Jacob bowed low seven times, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept. Genesis 33, 3. It's such a wondrous time of forgiveness and of peace. The writer of this story is holding out a olive branch, a hope that these two peoples can embrace and live together in peace. This is clearly one of the most intriguingly hopeful moments in the entire Bible. After this inspiring and moving reconciliation, God tells Jacob to return to Bethel, the place where he dreamed of the miraculous ladder. Jacob is to build an altar there and make Bethel his home. However, the prospect of a peaceful and happy life devoted to God is soon shattered. His beloved Rachel gives birth to a child, but in doing so, she dies. Jacob is devastated. With the death of Rachel, Jacob's career seems to be over. His lifetime of struggling and striving with God, his his manipulation, his dealing, his, his activity, his, his extraordinary human character with all of its faults seems to be stopped in its tracks with the death of his beloved wife. Rachel's baby survives. It is a boy, and his father names him Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand. He is, significantly, Jacob's twelfth son, the foundation for the 12 tribes of Israel is now complete. Strangely, Jacob's story, which has so profound an impact on history and civilization, has left little physical evidence. Perhaps this makes the sites which have been identified all the more holy and moving. Tradition says this is where Rachel was laid to her final rest. To this day, women hoping to become pregnant visit the tomb of the wife who longed to bear children for her husband. After Rachel's passing, the Bible's focus shifts from Jacob, although he lives on for many years. According to the Bible, when Jacob dies, he is laid to rest here, at Machpelah, in Hebron. His father Isaac is also said to lie here, and his grandfather, Abraham. This sacred place, where both Jews and Arabs worship, is called the Tomb of the Patriarchs. Many visitors believe it is protected by a mysterious force. The graves are said to be deep in a cave beneath the building. No one knows how deep or what condition they may be in. The problem is that there's no way to investigate this cave. There is a story that after 1967, the chief rabbi of the Israeli army at that time 
Rabbi Gorin attempted to enter the cave because he wanted to find out what was really going on. And when he proceeded down the steps and he got to like the fifth step, some type of force basically just opposed him and he could go down no further. In the centuries following Jacob's death, the 12 tribes which are descended from him populate the promised land. 10 tribes live in the north, two occupy the south. Then, in 722 before the Common Era, disaster strikes the northern tribes. A mighty enemy sweeps down upon them, the Assyrians. Swiftly it comes. It is a day of terrible distress and anguish, a day of ruin and desolation, trumpet calls and battle cries. Down go the walled cities and the battlements. Zephaniah, 1.14 As part of their effort to annihilate Israel, the conquerors strip the population from the land and deport them to captivity in Assyria. However, legends persist that these exiles did not lose their identity and eventually managed to establish new settlements somewhere outside of Israel. One of the most fascinating questions in historical studies of ancient Israel focuses clearly on this Assyrian deportation, the so-called Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. What happened to the Ten Lost Tribes? The mystery has tantalized countless generations of scholars, mystics, and dreamers who have scoured the world in search of the Lost Tribes. In modern times, this was carried out of all proportion when people said that the British were part of the 12 tribes or the Eskimos or the Indians or any strange group of people that they could find. Archaeologists may someday discover conclusive evidence of the final fate of the 10 lost tribes. However, other mysteries of Jacob's story will probably never be resolved because mystery is almost certainly a deliberate intended element of the Bible. That's not true of all ancient literature. It's not true of Homer. The Greeks tell you the whole story, complete from beginning to end, with all the details you need to know, and, and you have very little need for, uh, for deep investigation uh, into, into what's going on. Here we are, 2,000 years later, in some cases of biblical texts, 3,000 years later, we're still wondering about these texts. We're still investigating. We're still digging. One of the enduring questions raised by Jacob's story concerns the dream of Jacob's ladder. Why are the angels climbing in both directions, down from heaven and up toward it? It is in seeking an answer to this mystery that many find meaning and inspiration. In the Talmud, a rabbi is asked, what does God do now that God has finished creating the world? And his answer is, God spends his time making ladders for some to ascend and some to descend. And perhaps the message of this story of Jacob's dream is that God is saying to Jacob, Jacob, the world is filled with ladders and you can spend the rest of your life going up them or going down them, ascending or descending. But what you do from this moment on will be the shape of your life and your legacy to future generations. It is as though mystery is a force drawing us ever deeper into the characters, the stories, and the message of that sacred history which is the Holy Bible.